Hong Kong and Macau, two special administrative regions of China, and just a short ferry ride between the two. But while there's resistance in Hong Kong to Beijing's tightening control, Macau has embraced the one country, two systems rule. So why have they taken different paths? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohamed Jamjoum. A tiny former Portuguese colony, Macau, has marked 21 years since its return to China. It was agreed in 1999 that the territory would be governed under the Chinese one country, two systems rule, as is the case with Hong Kong. But this is where the similarity between the two ends. Many people in Hong Kong criticized China for undermining freedoms which were meant to be guaranteed for 50 years when sovereignty was handed back by the UK in 1997. Macau, on the other hand, has remained largely unaffected by the pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong. And Beijing has hailed it as a role model for how the political system works. Divya Gopalan reports. This is a tale of two cities. Macau, a former Portuguese colony, now a casino powerhouse. The other, Hong Kong, a former British colony and an international financial center. Both returned to Chinese rule in the late 1990s. But while Hong Kong pushed back against Beijing's tightening control in the following years, there was little opposition in Macau. Macau has a large population with a very strong mainland Chinese attachment, emotionally, politically and culturally. Having said that, in the recent years, there are a minority of young people in Macau who tend to support Western-style democracy. And one of those is 29-year-old Sulu Su, an opposition member of Macau's Legislative Assembly, who says gaining support for the fight for democracy is an uphill battle. Macau uh, handed over uh, in 1999 to China. Many people in Macau welcome and expect a better future. Um, and after 1999, Macau's uh, economy uh, developed uh, very fast. The government used uh, the economic resources to support the political control. While the British in Hong Kong instilled the idea of democracy in their final years, the Portuguese largely recognized China's sovereignty over Macau. Mainland China is crucial for the city's economy, bestowing favorable policies, boosting tourism, and building major infrastructure projects like the $20 billion Hong Kong Macau Zhuhai Bridge. Perhaps this is the most tangible symbol of the Communist Party's push to integrate Hong Kong and Macau into mainland China. When it was launched two years ago, it became the first physical link between the two former colonies and set them up for the next phase of unification, the Greater Bay Area Development Plan. It's part of Beijing's efforts to knit Hong Kong, Macau and southern Chinese cities into a tech hub. Macau is a very small open economy and it, uh, the population okay, is very small too and it is uh, living in a very restricted area of about 32 kilometers square. So what Macau can do is limited. With the strong support from China, Macau has tried to diversify its economy. China's leader Xi Jinping called Macau a shining example of the one country, two systems policy. One that Beijing says Hong Kong's outspoken people could learn from. Divya Gopalan, Al Jazeera, Hong Kong. All right, let's bring in our guests in Hong Kong. We have Andrew Lung, an international China strategist. Steve Tseng is director of the China Institute at SOAS University of London, and he joins us from Nottingham. And joining us from Hong Kong is Stephen Vines, a journalist and author who specializes in China's politics. Welcome to each of you. Stephen Vines, let me start with you today. Macau and Hong Kong have a lot in common, but why are their views and stances toward democracy seemingly so different? A lot of it's to do with the history of the two places, as, as um, your report that we've just seen showed. It's a very small place. It has a very different history from Hong Kong. But I think most importantly, more or less now, the majority of the people in Macau come from the Chinese mainland. They're much closer 
emotionally and politically to the um, communist system that prevails on the mainland. And indeed, they haven't had the long tradition that there's been in Hong Kong, by long I mean a few decades, of being part of a democracy movement, having pressure on the authorities to enhance the democratic government of Hong Kong. None of these things have happened in Macau. So, you know, there's actually quite a big divide between the two. Andrew Lung, is Macau really a one country, two systems success story? Well, I uh, spent my boyhood uh, in Macau. Uh, suffice it to, uh, to qualify myself uh, formally as a Macau citizen as well. So I know Macau pretty well. And I, I must say that Macau is a very, very different from Hong Kong in its political makeup uh, and, of course, uh, in its history uh, and its um, various institutions. Um, but uh, because of the, the lack of, of interest in taking part in adversarial politics in Macau, uh, and because the people, um, they are all mostly employed by one single industry, which is the, uh, uh, the, uh, the gambling and convention industry, um, you know, they, they're, they're not really interested in, in, in politics. Um, so comparing Hong Kong and Macau uh, is, is really uh, comparing chalk with cheese. They're very, very different. Um, and of course, because of the compliant uh, kind of uh, uh, Macau uh, population, um, one country, two systems seems to be um, succeeding reasonably well. But uh, in the sense that, of course, Macau is a different kind of legal system based on a Portuguese kind of law. And before they hand over, the Macau, um, uh, uh, the Portuguese government, or the Chinese government, actually, before the handover, trained some of the potential uh, the legal officers in, um, in, 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 in Portugal, um, and, and even some of the future administrators. So the Macau administration was much better prepared um, to become, um, uh, to, to return to the motherland under this one country, two system of Macau. Um, Steve saying, let me ask you, uh, you heard what um, Andrew was saying there about, um, you know, how Macau being more pro-China. Uh, many people attribute that to the fact that the Portuguese were proactive in integrating Communist Party of China elements into Macau's governance ahead of the handover. Do you think that's correct? Well, there is certainly an element of truth in that the Portuguese colonial administration was much more um, willing to work with the Chinese authorities even before 1999. But to me, the really big difference between Hong Kong and Macau was the reality that in late colonial Hong Kong, it developed a very large and vibrant and increasingly well-off middle class. And this is the middle class that would assert rights that they were uh, given to understand as available in the late British colonial era with a very strong rule of law political system. So you're talking about a place where you have this normal, strong, vibrant middle class demanding their rights and therefore going for democratic rights, which simply did not exist in Macau. And that's also why Macau after 1999 could be so readily compliant with the expectations of the Chinese authorities in Beijing. And in that sense, Beijing would be considering Macau as a success of the one country, two systems, but not if the one country, two systems is to, un to be understood in the sense of what it was going to create a conditions to allow Hong Kong or Macau to be distinctly separate and distinct from the mainland of China. Stephen Vines, by and large, how did the people of Macau react to the protests uh, in Hong Kong? And was there a generational split in how the people of Macau perceived what was going on in Hong Kong? Well, I, I think that's very interesting because the, the, the fact is that there have not been widespread protests in Macau. But there have been, among younger people in Macau, a lot of interest in what's going on or what has been going on in Hong Kong. Incidentally, 
quite a lot of young people from Macau came over to Hong Kong to take part in the protests. Among the older generation, maybe not so much interest. But I think that, that although you haven't seen anything like the kind of protests at any level in Macau that you have seen in Hong Kong, that doesn't mean that there isn't a generation of people there who aren't interested in enhancing democracy and indeed in asserting the autonomy that was promised to them under the one country, two systems. I think that perhaps as Macau develops, uh, this of course assumes that they won't keep filling it up with people from the mainland, but as Macau develops, we're probably going to see more in Macau on that side of things. Andrew Leung, over the years, how much of an effort have Macau's political leaders put into enacting legislation that would curb dissent? Well, there's not much uh, dissent to curb uh, in, uh, in the first place in Macau um, because they, the population was uh, largely uh, compliant. Uh, and, and then they've, they've seen a huge uh, sort of uh, economic and, and job opportunities. Um, and they, 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 they seem to be getting on quite well, um, you know, without worrying about, uh, without bothering about this um, adversarial uh, politics uh, which obtained in Hong Kong. Uh, and also, of course, because the, um, uh, in Hong Kong, um, the, um, what was not in the Joint Declaration, that's the universal suffrage, was included um, in the uh, Hong Kong's basic law. Um, but the, um, the election of the chief executive, uh, there's a, a catch to it uh, in the eyes of Beijing that the candidates need to be pre-screened. Uh, in fact, that this is stated, stated in the basic law um, that um, um, is that the, the, the election uh, of a chief executive, um, the candidates um, have got to be selected by uh, an election committee. Um, but this is regarded as non-democratic, uh, and then the uh, package for universal suffrage was rejected. And that uh, more into the kind of uh, umbrella movement and later the kind of um, uh, anti-extradition bill uh, kind of movement. Um, and the whole city is now um, absolutely divided. And that's not uh, the same as in Macau. Steve saying, are there freedoms and liberties that exist for the people of Macau that do not exist in mainland China? I think you do have a higher degree of individual freedom and autonomy in Macau than you have on the mainland of China. I think what we're dealing with here is a kind of irony. Um, the Communist Party of China is about control. China proper, mainland China, is completely under the control of the Communist Party, and they are very cautious in terms of allowing for uh, much scope of any activities that would amount to any challenge to the authority of the Chinese state. Now, in Macau and in Hong Kong, they are actually willing to allow for more scope of that kind of activities, provided those activities do not amount to any challenge to the authority of the Communist Party. And this is where you have the distinction between Hong Kong and Macau. In Hong Kong, people asserted it much more, and as a result of which, the Chinese government, the Communist Party, imposed very stringent control now in Hong Kong, which it hasn't uh, imposed in Macau, because the people of Macau are not asserting that right so much. So where we are is that if the people of Macau were to assert the individual rights promised to them under the one country, two systems model, then they would face what people in Hong Kong face as well. Stephen Vines, um, if we're talking about China seeing Macau as a model example of one country, two systems, let me ask you this. Does China see Macau as a model of that one country, two systems that could perhaps convince Taiwan of following the same path? Well, I mean, let's look at the history of this. The original concept of one country, two systems from China's paramount leader, Deng Xiaoping, in the 1980s was actually aimed at Taiwan. It was conceived for bringing Taiwan back into the fold of mainland China. And Hong Kong and Macau were seen to be the testing grounds. They thought, you know, we'll, we'll give it a go there and the people of Taiwan 
will be persuaded that it will be a good system for them. The reality is, particularly since the crackdown in Hong Kong, is that the people in Taiwan have become more alienated from the mainland. And indeed, as we saw in the presidential election that occurred at the end of last year in Taiwan, that the winning candidate, President Tsai Ing-wen, made a point at every single rally that she held of saying, if you want to be like Hong Kong, vote for the opposition, don't vote for me. So, I mean, the PRC has done a fantastic job in mobilizing the people of Taiwan away from its primary objective. And Taiwan is much more important to mainland China than Hong Kong or Macau. Andrew Lung, does China hope to make Macau a replacement for Hong Kong as an international finance center and financial hub? Well, I don't think that there's uh, any equivalence uh, between Hong Kong and Macau. Uh, and, and, uh, and least of all, I don't think that uh, the Beijing wants to uh, use Macau as an example uh, of uh, reuniting Taiwan, because the Taiwan politics are entirely different. Uh, because uh, a lot of the people who, um, um, who are in Taiwan, uh, they're born in Taiwan, and they have uh, very little... Uh, kind of um, empathy uh, with the mainland. But as far as Macau is concerned, uh, there is no comparison, even though Macau is, uh, in per capita terms, is the second richest uh, territory in the world, just um, uh, 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 below Luxembourg. Um, and it's uh, uh, twice as uh, rich as Hong Kong um, on a per capita basis. But in terms of international connectivity, in terms of being a financial center, in terms of um, um, uh, being held up as a, 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 a metropolitan city, there's simply no comparison. Uh, so I don't think that Beijing is under any illusion uh, that Macau could be used as an example, even though Beijing could be satisfied that the mistake, how things are going in Macau under one country, two system. But the, but the two are, are very, very different as chalk from cheese. Steve saying nearly half of the population of Macau were born in mainland China, and you compare that to just over 20% of the population in Hong Kong. Do the people of Macau turn to mainland China more uh, when it comes to the purposes of identification? I think people in Macau accepted the unification with China. They have, I think, as one of your other guests say, uh, some people in Macau who also want to uh, develop democracy in Macau, but they are the minority and they know that. And therefore, they are much more willing to work with the Chinese government. I think it is um, a slightly dubious assumption that if somebody were born on the mainland of China and then relocated to either Hong Kong or Macau, they would necessarily continue to simply support the Chinese Communist Party system. I think you have a very mixed picture there. Some of the people who left mainland China for Hong Kong or Macau wanted to have a much freer um, political environment to live and work. Now, some of them don't. So they are also very, very mixed. And I don't think we should go into this kind of communal divisions and assume that somebody born in China would necessarily support the Communist Party system. Stephen Vines, let me ask you to expand uh, on what uh, Steve was saying there as well. I mean, is that a faulty assumption that because more of the population in Macau were born in mainland China, that they would have more sympathetic views toward the mainland? Well, I, I, I agree with that in principle, but I think that there is a very important element to the Hong Kong protest, which is due to the identity of people as Hong Kongers, something which Beijing dislikes very considerably. They think that people in Hong Kong should just identify themselves as being Chinese. So it doesn't quite matter where people are born. What does matter is the community in which they live and the community that's developed as Hong Kong has a very, very vibrant civil society, a society which prides in its identification with Hong Kong. One of the big slogans 
of the protest movement was very simple. It said, I am a Hong Konger. And this in Macau doesn't exist. I, whether it's to do with where people are born, I'm not so sure. But it's the state of civil society. Steve Chung earlier said uh, this is to do with the development of a bigger middle class in Hong Kong. Well, I would argue, because I was very much on the ground during the protests, a lot of the people taking part in those protests were not middle class at all. They were from working class areas. And what motivated them to be on the streets was their sense of identity of as being Hong Kongers. And, you know, I don't know whether that would develop in Macau. I think there are many reasons, as we've seen in this discussion, why maybe it won't. But, you know, I'm not over-exercised by the question of where people are, are originally from. Andrew Lung, I saw you nodding along to some of what Stephen Vines was saying there. Did you want to jump in and add to the point he was making? Well, I agree that um, identity um, uh, is, is extremely important uh, because that's the, the part of the reason um, uh, behind the, the Hong Kong protests. But I think that that's not uh, just a simplistic picture. Uh, although Hong Kong, uh, a lot of Hong Kong um, think Hong Kongers think that they are just Hong Kong uh, persons uh, without a sense of nation, uh, a very strong sense of nationhood. Uh, you Macau, if you ask me, because I'm, I hold a Macau um, a citizen card as well, right, because I lived there long enough. Um, if you uh, ask me whether I'm a Macau person or a Chinese person, I can say that I'm also a Macau person because I spent my boyhood there. But the sense of identity. Uh, that is not uh, at odds with my sense of, 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 of being Chinese, of being belonging to the Chinese nation. So I think that this uh, kind of conflict uh, between the identity and the, and the nationhood is much, much stronger in Hong Kong. Whereas in Macau, they seem to coexist. Steve Sang, analysts have said that Macau faces challenges in developing financial services, um, what are some of those challenges? And also, going forward, how much of an impact has COVID-19 has, uh, has it had on the country and on the economy? Right. Well, in, ter in terms of the uh, obstacles for Macau to develop into a financial center, I think the question can be asked in terms of, can Las Vegas become a financial center like New York? Because that is what we re really are comparing. Hong Kong, like New York, has all the infrastructures in place, both in terms of the legal framework, the uh, service sector, and the educated manpower to become a global financial center. And they are all lacking in Macau. And therefore, Macau simply cannot become the global financial center that Hong Kong is. In terms of um, the impact of COVID-19, I think what we are looking at is that China has contained COVID-19 quite effectively through very stringent measures at the early stage of the pandem pandemic. Um, Macau and Hong Kong has contained it a bit less uh, successfully than uh, mainland China, but they are using less stringent measures. Um, but they, there will be efforts by the Chinese government to try to work things out with Hong Kong and Macau, and they will still be integrated into part of the Chinese mainland economy. I think that is where the Greater Bay Area concept is very important from the Chinese government's perspective for the development and the future of both Hong Kong and Macau. They see both Hong Kong and Macau now as part of the Greater Bay Area, which is centered around Shenzhen, very, very different mm. from the 1980s and 90s when one country, two systems were being promised and Hong Kong and, Ma and Macau being uh, allowed to develop as special administrative regions mm. in their own right. They are now not being allowed to develop in their own rights. They are going to be part of a greater Bay Area under Chinese control moving forward. All right, we've run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thanks so much to all our guests, Andrew Lung, Steve Sang, and Stephen Vines. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.